this week on the Back Table Podcast. And pimping was one of those things that's just been so ingrained in the medical culture that people just don't realize that that's a horrible, horrible way to do education. And I think I sent Gopi this, this article, and I strongly recommend mm-hmm. all the listeners to read this. It's Socrates was not a pimp. And this, a lot of people think that, that cold calling and pimping is actually the Socratic method, and that's not the Socratic method. What the Socratic method was, was to ask why, to drive deeper understanding and trying to follow up on questions to really drive people's interest and curiosity into finding out more. Welcome to Backtable ENT. We are your hosts, Gopi Shah and me, Ashley Agan. We have a very special guest today, Dr. Eric Gantworker. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist. He was my partner and is still a special friend to me. He's got a special interest in medical education. He, in fact, has a master's in medical education and is the vice president and medical director of Level X. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Glad to be here. So tell us, you know, what exact, how did you get your interest in medical education or in education in general? What does it mean to have a master specifically in medical education? Yeah, I was just bored one day and I saw an advertisement <laughs> and I was like, hey, yeah, that sounds like something I'd like to do. Um, you know, I, I've, I've always had an interest in education. You know, my dad was a Chicago public school teacher and his one piece of advice to me was don't become a teacher. So um, <laughs> instead, I became a doctor, which you know, was Latin. Instead, you became a surgeon. <laughs> exactly, which, uh, you know, doctor's Latin for teacher. So there you go. So I, yeah. I stuck it to him. Um, but, you know, my mom <laughs> actually went to college to be an educator as well. So it's always sort of, I like to say it's been in my blood. And throughout my entire career, both in undergraduate studies and with all my volunteer work, I've really been interested in tutoring and teaching and education. And after I finished my fellowship uh, in Boston at Boston Children's, they were actually starting up a new master's of medical education program. And so I sort of saw it as a sign. And I, I applied and, you know, interviewed. It was a whole process and uh, became the inaugural class of the master's in uh, medical science and medical education at at Harvard Med. And uh, the nice thing was, is I was sort of the first, uh, you know, inaugural class. And we had a lot of leeway in how we uh, designed our program, as opposed to something that's been longstanding and everything sort of planned out for you. And so my special interest was actually in educational technology, uh, the cognitive science of learning, motivational theory, and educational research. And I was able to sort of uh, tailor made a program for myself to sort of focus on those areas. And I, I, it was the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. So was this, you know, after medical school, after residency, at what point did you go and do the master's program there? Yeah, so I it was right during the last year of my fellowship. So I had a one year fellowship, and I basically deferred my my work. I was actually I had already accepted a job in Dallas, and said, you know, can I can I defer a year to do this master's program? And Ron Mitchell, you know, fantastic mentor and, and your, your shout current out. boss. Yes, shout uh, out, yeah, exactly. <laughs> shout out to Ron Mitchell. Um, you know, who, who really was willing to, to wait and, and, and Brad Marple too, you yeah. know, and I really appreciate everything that they, you know, supported me uh, through that process. And so I de- essentially deferred a year and uh, did the master's that year. It was a two-year master's. So the first year I spent actually on site in Boston, I was actually working part-time at Boston Children's. And then the second year, which actually eventually got expanded into a you know, two half years were done and down in Dallas. So I actually finished my master's thesis project while I was in Dallas for the first two years. And so, you know, Ashley does a lot. Uh, she's our uh, director for medical student education for our department of otolaryngology. And I'm the fellowship director for pediatric otolaryngology. And yet I feel like there's so much that, you know, when it comes to our residents, medical students, fellows with teaching that, you know, Maybe I kind of get, but I feel like there's so much more that we could be doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, I wanted to get out of my program was have a better understanding of sort of the cognitive science of learning and what are the underlying principles that I can build off of. And a lot of people are sort of interested in in master's programs, or at least in some advanced professional development in medical education or education in general. They ask me, you know, should I do an intensive program? Should I do online classes? Should I enroll in this sort of leadership program that's over several weeks? Should I actually go get a degree and really 
really what it comes down to is do you want to get better skills or do you want to get a degree? And for me, I really wanted to get the skills. It, it just so happened that I found a good program that I felt fit me as well as giving me credentials to be able to do it. But it's really sort of what you made of it. And, and for me, understanding how people learn and adult learning theory, you know, Malcolm Knowles' adult learning theory and understanding how it differs from pedagogy and how we teach young kids, it, it opened the doors for me and really helped me with my own teaching. And I've put very specific things into practice, both in medical student education, as well as residency education and professional development. So I'm even teaching other colleagues that are, you know, even older than myself on some of these principles so they can really enact them, digest them and put them into practice for themselves. So definitely more than a see one, do one, teach one, the traditional stuff that we learn, I feel like, <laughs> at a, at a surgical residency. Absolutely. The, the, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about see one, do one, teach one. And I think in procedural education, it's sort of been very much popularized uh, because if you can really tell and understand what people are doing and how they do it, then you can sort of do it yourself. The, the problem is, is that if you don't have a deep understanding of what they're doing, you may miss things, right? And so we've all been with surgeons or proceduralists who are so good. We watch them do it and we're like, I, I totally got that. Yeah. They made it look so easy. And then you get in there and you're like, oh my God, I can't can't do this at all. Right. right. And so it's because they've gone through this entire learning process to get out all the inefficiencies that a lot of novices have when they're doing new procedures or even doing uh, cognitive skills. There's a lot of inefficiencies built in. And so you see it as a nice, easy, fluid uh, procedure or surgery. But when you get in there, you're all thumbs. And, right. and so that's where see one, do and teach one sort of falls away because you, you don't see the deeper, you know, months and, you know, the old 10,000 hours rule, the 10,000 hours of practice that they put in to get it to that point that, that you're seeing it right at that moment. Yeah. So, so let's get into it then. So what are, what are these, mo what, are, what would you say are the most important principles that you try to, that you follow when you're, when you're teaching or, or can you give us any pearls? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of cognitive theories that sort of underlie, um, and a few of them, I'll just uh, talk about them as my favorites. So cognitive load is probably one of the uh, more familiar cognitive theories of learning, and that is essentially that you only have a given cognitive ability to hold information in your working memory. And so a lot of people say you can hold maybe about seven to 10 different things in your working memory. This is why phone numbers actually have seven digits, because that was sort of the mental capacity of your working memory. And the idea is, is when you manipulate information, you can take it from working memory and put it into uh, uh, medium term memory and then eventually long term memory. And so when we're designing any kind of educational experience, the first thing I understand is that a novice coming to a new environment has tremendous amount of mental power, just figuring out where the heck they are, what the heck they're supposed to do, let alone mm -hmm. what you're trying to tell them what to do. And mm -hmm. so what I try to do, and uh, this is a really big uh, mech, uh, a really big a thing in, in cognitive science of learning that people do, it's called chunking. And so what you do is you try to basically chunk up the task into much smaller tasks. And you try to remove any extraneous things out of the environment so that they don't have to worry about everything. They just hyper-focus on what you're doing. And the example I give is when I'm teaching tonsillectomy. So every, you know, three, four months, you get a new resident, second year mm -hmm. resident who's never done tonsils before. Right. And so instead of having them like sit at the front of the head, put the headlight on, put the oral gas, in, and then, you know, they basically get like one pass with the bovie and then you take it away from them because they're taking too long. Right. So I, I do the exact opposite. What I do is, uh, again, a shout out to David Robertson, who, who was doing this for a very long time. He was chunking up the skill and he was one of my fellowship attendings. And he didn't realize that what he was doing, again, sort of that faculty development that you sort of learn by people, mentor, uh, by modeling people without understanding the deeper kind of science of what you're doing. But he, what he did was he put the mouth gag in. He actually took a whole tonsil out, and then he took out uh, half of the next tonsil, and then let the resident sit down and take out that last half of the tonsil. And then the next time they did it, he, he left a little bit more of the second tonsil, and then a little bit more. And right. then they started the second tonsil, but he started the entire procedure the whole way so that they saw it multiple, multiple times, and they didn't have to worry about putting the mouth gag in, which is where most students get stuck. And right. we all know that putting the mouth gag in is not the most important part of the surgery. The most important part of surgery is taking the tonsils out. 
And so he basically parsed it up. And by the time they uh, had done the entire procedure, they had finished the procedure a hundred times, right? Or however many times. Mm -hmm. And so having that feeling of success, which is another thing to think about in the in that ability to have more self-efficacy, which is your confidence in your ability to do something. So you build that self-efficacy by having them complete the surgery, and then you actually take them through and they can only hyper-focus on that one little aspect. And then you start adding things as they get better, better with time. Right. And it, it's a genius application. And, and Dr. Robertson didn't, didn't totally understand what exactly he was doing, but that's 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 one thing that I'm a big believer in. One other thing that I'll briefly mention is sort of uh, what we call in in cognitive psychology is the zone of proximal development. It's one of my favorite concepts, and actually it, the same exists in games. And it's called the regime of competence. It's a basically understanding that all of your students don't come in at the same level, right. and essentially what you have to do is you have to challenge them to their abilities. And if you make the task too easy, they'll disengage. If you make it too hard, they'll give up. And so it's this idea of scaffolding the task just so much that they can actually succeed and extend themselves uh, beyond what they thought they could do and then continue to challenge them throughout the procedure. Gopi, I've seen you do this. Uh, you, you are actually teaching sinus surgery. One of the things you do is you give them graduated responsibility. And as you see their abilities progress, you give them more and more tasks to do that are more complicated. Yeah. Right. At first, it's just put the scope in and don't hit the middle turbinate. Right. right? That's like basically the first 10 times. Right. Right. So, so, but as they get their abilities, you actually give them more and more to do. And when they get to things that are really, really difficult, the best, the best teachers help them just over the hump and give it back to the student or back to the trainee, back to the resident to continue on so that when you come back, now they feel like they, if they mess up, you're not going to take the rest of the surgery away from them. Right. And so that idea of scaffolding the learning, increasing the task at challenge as they go is, is one of those principles. And it, make, it leads to the most effective and efficient way to teach. It's it's hard. I mean, it requires patience, a <laughs> um, ton and, of patience, and, and some and some maybe some plan uh, planning as well, and kind of how you lay out the case in your mind of how it may or may not go. How do you apply some of this in the clinic or the classroom? Yeah, so I do. I'm a big believer in chunking. So I do. I do do that where I'm teaching a tonsillectomy. I'll do the, you know, the first 75% of the surgery and then slowly work back, allowing them to take over more and more. I really do sort of give them advice uh, minute by minute during the procedure. Say, hey, you know, maybe you should try this. I, I let them struggle. The struggle matters. That's where learning happens. If you take things away and don't allow your trainees to struggle, then they don't learn to problem solve. And if they know that you're there at all times, every time they struggle, they won't challenge themselves and they won't move forward. So you have to allow the struggle in a safe environment. And once you sort of see like, hey, they're really having problem solved, maybe I can do a little something to get them over the hump, then I'll step in. For example, I'll let them start the tonsillectomy. And if I start seeing them getting into the tonsil, I'll let them go just a little bit more, but yeah. not too much that I think it's dangerous. And then I'll say, okay, step back. What are we looking at? What do you think is happening? And again, I challenge them and I, and I ask them, you know, what, what would you like to do? What, what are the things you should do differently? And then when we go to the other side, I say, okay, what happened on the right side that you can apply to the left side? And also I do a, a sort of a debrief with my residents and trainees afterwards. So I'll ask them, you know, at least early on, on after each procedure, okay, what went well? What do you think you did really well? What are the things that you think you need to work on? And most importantly, what can I do as a teacher to improve your learning? Yeah. Because, you know, if I'm hand holding and you don't want me hand holding, or if I'm stepping back too much, you want me to be more, you know, correct you earlier on, that gives you a lot of, of feedback to them. And it also gives you a sense of their insight into their abilities. If they're like, oh, I, I you know, I did awesome. I, I, I'm so great. I'm the, I'm the best tonsillectomy surgeon in, in the world. You already know that this is somebody you may not be able to trust um, because they may not, they may not have good insight into their abilities. And overconfidence is one of the scary 
scariest things in surgery, as you guys all know. Right. So you really get a lot of in, not only give them feedback, you get feedback yourself to say, hey, you know, how can I enable your teaching? And I'll tell you, most of the time, they don't really give you much feedback, but I, I have gotten really good actionable feedback. Hey, you were micromanaged me during this procedure. Let me struggle a little bit more. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that feedback. Next time I step back and let them struggle a little bit more. Right. And so really you're at the end of the day, as a teacher, you're there for them. You're there to have them walk out with the skill set that's needed to achieve the task at hand. You know, it doesn't help me teaching uh, unless somebody gets something out of it. And so I want to be the most effective teacher for them. So I accept feedback just as much as I give it. Yeah, I, I think feedback is important. And I, I have I have asked residents about, you know, how do, how do you think that went or, or kind of, you know, approach that? And I have a really hard time getting them to give me much. <laughs> I mean, have, is there something, is there something that you do or that you recommend to kind of encourage them to feel comfortable telling you to, you know, stop micromanaging them or to, to back off a little bit? Or is it, you think it's just with time, you get more comfortable working with someone and then they, yeah, feel like they can be more honest. I think part of it is definitely establishing a rapport with the individual. But I think as with any educational experience, it's establishing a safe space so that they can understand that you're not going to be judgmental, that you're here for them. And I say that up front, and that's the expectations when I walk in. When I walk in with a new student, I have a whole a, a whole sort of sit down with them, and I say, listen, my job as a, tra as a trainer, as a teacher here, is to make you better and to get you to the best you could be in the time that we have together. And I said, I will, I will, I will watch you. I will work with you and I will try to make you better. Uh, but you have to, you have to come halfway and meet me there. Yeah. And if I'm doing something that you don't like, tell me, because again, I'm trying to be the best teacher possible to move you forward. And I said, if I feel like you are not, you, you don't have the insight, then I will course correct you. Obviously I won't let you do anything dangerous, but please honestly feel free to say anything back to me to make sure that we're hitting the target. And I also talk about with residents, this is another sort of side piece uh, to that, is that uh, there's a back boxing analogy called line speed beauty. And so what I, I sort of tell the students up front, you know, my job is to teach you the line at first. You have to know the steps of the procedure. And mm -hmm. uh, once you get the basics down, okay, this is what I do, then this, then this, then this, then we work on speed, in which in my mind is actually efficiency. It's not necessarily speed because speed implies lower quality. Right. Efficiency a lot, you know, implies that you maintain quality, but you remove excess steps. I said, so my job is once you get the basics down, I'm going to get you to be more efficient with your time, more efficient movements. For the tonsillectomy, it's don't take your foot off the coblator or the bovi. Um, uh, every single time, because that start, stop, start, stop really slows you down. You know, you need to be better about being mindful about where the tip is, but try to keep it going as long as possible. And then beauty, I make it, make it so you make it look easy, just like any expert would, they make it look easy. And I said, I'm going to keep teaching you the entire time because I know that within this time period, I can make you make it look easy and take you to that utmost level where you can problem solve in the hardest of situations. And so I don't let off the gas whether it's the first day of their training or it's the last day I have them for their training, because I always feel there's room for improvement. Right. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. L line speed beauty. Is that what you said? Line speed beauty? Speed beauty. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. I like that. I like the question you had, Ash, about the feedback and the persistence, Eric, about just sitting down and constantly, you know, defining your role as, hey, how can I help you? How can I help you? I'm here to teach you. I'm here to teach you. And it, it brings me to how we, you know, evaluate our residents. That's always a big topic and question of, you know, are we evaluating our residents? Do you think evaluations even matter and it's more of what we do in our day-to-day -day? or how do we sort of, you know, make our evaluations so they're, you know, not just these check boxes that, you know, have these wordy check boxes that we don't even really read just to kind of push people through? Yeah, there's a there's an entire school of thought on assessment. And, you know, uh, there's also one thing that's sort of embedded in this is the idea of a coach versus a mentor. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And the other, the other conflating uh, part of this is being a friend, right? So right. a lot of us, especially, you know, the three of us are relatively close in age to a lot of our trainees, especially if they're chiefs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you sort of make friends with them. And, and so trying to be objective and give them feedback doesn't always get taken well. And I've, I've had that experience, especially with fellows who are relatively close in age to myself. So it's hard. It's really hard to give objective assessments. And, you know, honestly, I think that number one, uh, when you're assessing somebody, you need to orient them to that, right? I, you know, I, we need to give an, a, you a objective assessment of your skills. Please don't take this as a judgment on your personal character. This is only based on the behavior you have shown and in the vein of us trying to make you improve. Right. So again, it's all about setting up expectations, setting a safe space, telling that it's non judgmental, and say, you know, I'm, I'm stepping into my role as an assessor right now. And, and so that they know this is not my friend talking to me. Right. And so I think that setting up, setting the stage is really important regardless of what you're doing, but especially when you're doing assessment. And one of the fallacies I made was I saved it for the end of the quarter assessment. Yeah, And this happened actually when I was in Dallas, I had a resident who I gave, you know, not the greatest evaluation to, and the resident contacted me and said, what the hell? Like, yeah. where did this come from? You didn't give me any of this feedback during, and I, he or she was absolutely right that I did not give that feedback at the time. And that was my mistake. If you see that, you want to give more formative assessments. So the idea that you're actually giving ongoing feedback with a purpose of improvement, as opposed to only giving a summative feedback or summative assessment, which is a, a grade, which is a basically a score of performance. Right. So, so I think that my, my mistake was not giving ongoing feedback to this individual to make them improve. And instead, it came as a summative assessment. And again, that was another thing where this person was a little bit more advanced. We were closer in age. We were sort of friendly with each other. Right. And so that was sort of part of the part of the problem that also fed into that. Yeah. Feedback is difficult. Boundaries are hard. And I always have a hard time with, you know, difficult conversations sometimes or feedback that, you know, isn't like you're doing great. I'm super impressed, you know, like. I have a hard time, you know, yeah. you need to work on this or the feedback that's actually super important and that people want. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun to give positive feedback. It's not as fun to have to, you know, give a negative or more constructive criticism, but it sounds like that's even more important though, is especially if, if we have, if there's concerns and there is room for improvement, it sounds like that we should give that sooner rather than later. Right. Absolutely. And, and the worst thing you can ever tell somebody you're assessing is you're doing great or read more. One of the, one of the principles of feedback is that you have to give them something specific and something actionable. Yeah. And so one of the worst things I always get, you were talking about assessments and check boxes, right. the, the evaluations that we give to our residents and that even that we get back is like a Likert scale where you know everything's fours and fives and everybody says in the comments read more or doing great no concerns right we're we're not all the best at what we do there's <laughs> got to be opportunities for improvement the problem is is that we don't get the time to do it we don't get the setting to do it and by the time you have to do it you have to grade 20 residents yep. as opposed to you know doing one or two and so it's part of it is the system for sure. There, there's definitely faults in the system of how we do assessment, but also it's, it's a lack of effort sometimes on the, per, on the teacher side, which yeah. is sad because basically you are, sh you are cutting short the abilities of these trainees by not caring enough to actually push them along. And the people, you know, when I did my thesis, one of the things I asked about was, do you have mentors or, or teachers that you remember to this day? They could be from middle school, they could be from high school, college, med school, wherever, you know, who are those people and why do you remember them? And the overarching theme was they cared about me and they were passionate about what they were teaching. And yeah. so I always remember whenever I'm going into it, I'm trying to show care by investing in this person's future and trying to push them forward to the best of their abilities. And that's always where I'm coming from. That's where I always set the table with them. And doing read more has got the honest worst thing you could ever do for somebody. <laughs> um, but I can't, I can't understate enough to give them 
examples and actionable feedback that are very specific. You know, when you were doing the tonsillectomies in, in my room, I noticed that you you had a hard time. I noticed that the there was difficulty in identifying the right plane. Right. One thing I want you to work on is trying to stay superficial while trying to extract the tonsillectomy so that the so that the the plane shows itself a little bit more before you dive deep into the into the tonsil. You know, the more specific, the more actionable. So they're like, okay, well, I need to be better at identifying the plane. And we do that as we go through the day, say, hey, you know what? What do you think went wrong with that last tonsil? Let's think about this for the next one. Let's focus on that. And you do that. The other big thing is with ear surgery, right? So everybody talks about cochlear implants and, you know, uh, you do like, you know, a hundred mastoidectomies for every cochlear implant you actually do. So, you know, one of the things that I think in, in cochlear implants is you should say, Hey, do you want to do the soft tissue? You want to do the bony work? Right. Do you want to do the facial recess? And you want to do the cochleostomy, right? So you can keep the procedure going by having them hyper-focus on the areas where they need, they need to improve. Right. I admire your passion for teaching. And, you know, as, you know, being in academic medicine, you don't get enough formal teaching. It's hard, you know, just to have people around as colleagues that are that inspired to make you want to do more and be better. I can't thank you enough. And I know you gave us, uh, Eric gave us a uh, faculty workshop on teaching a couple of years ago. And it just, it was, life-changing for me personally, because I learned a lot about myself as a learner, as well as a teacher. And so it was super helpful. And we have Eric coming back at UT to do more with teaching in a journal club. So super, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. Anyways, thank you, Eric. I really of I, course. I just love the passion. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so you thank excited you. Now. <laughs> I think, you know, I, you're right that the majority of people who are teaching in medicine have no formal education, how to teach. A lot of us just learn by uh, figuring out what worked for us and didn't work for us. And one of the things that ends up happening is, is you take superficial things that you learned, whether they were good or bad, and you put them into practice. One good example of that is pimping. Pimping has been a long cultural phenomenon within education in, in medical school where, you know, you cold call somebody, you call somebody by name and say, hey, in front of everybody else, what, you know, what does, what happens with carbon dioxide and respiratory acidosis, right? So if you cold call somebody in the middle of a room, you have no idea that person's emotional state. You have no idea what their actual knowledge base is. And now you put them on, 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 on blast in front of everybody yeah. else. And, and pimping was one of those things that's just been so ingrained in the medical culture that people just don't realize that that's a horrible, horrible way to do education. And I think I sent Gopi this, this article, and I strongly recommend mm -hmm. all the listeners to read this. It's Socrates was not a pimp. And this, a lot of people think that, that cold calling and pimping is actually the Socratic method, and that's not the Socratic method. What the Socratic method was, was to ask why, to drive deeper understanding and trying to follow up on questions to really drive people's interest and curiosity into finding out more. It wasn't cold calling people to ask them fact-based questions. You, you read my mind, Eric. I was going to, I was going to ask you about that because I've heard you talk about not cold calling before, but, but, you know, kind of to piggyback on that. So if, if, if cold calling and pimping is not a good way to kind of help students and residents learn information how do you go about um, teaching the the subject matter? So let's, you know, kind of flip it to a, a classroom or a clinic setting when you're trying to teach about a certain disease pathology, like, so, you know, when we're, when we're not talking about learning how to do a procedure, but when we're talking about just, you know, the, the actual stuff that we all, you know, have to memorize or different things like that. How, what's your approach when, when you're either lecturing or when you're working one-on-one -on -one on, uh, one -on -one with students uh, and residents to just teach the material? Yeah, so I have, I have two examples of that. The first one's a little bit easier. So one of the things that novices, anybody who's new to a certain domain or a certain field, um, they have no way to organize information. And so what ends up happening is, is they actually try to retain facts and information, and it ends up scattered across their brain. And when information is scattered and it's not interconnected, it's very hard to retrieve that information. And so one of the first things I do with any student or trainee that's going to be with me, 
we pick a topic, for example, Strider or hearing loss. Hearing loss is another one of my favorite things. And for Strider, we try to go back to the very, very basics. You know, what is Strider? What is happening? Again, our very uh, conceptual understanding, instead of having them fa fact-based memorize, what are all the causes of Strider? That's not helpful because now they have no way to think about it on a deeper level. And if you have deep understanding within a domain, you're able to transfer that knowledge to other aspects of the domain. The other example I give is, is the hearing loss. So when I talk about hearing loss, whether you're a medical student or a resident, I'm going to start the same way. How do you organize hearing loss in your brain? There's a lot of dichotomies within hearing loss. One is genetic or non-genetic, syndromic, non-syndromic, and general or acquired, sensorineural neural or conductive hearing loss or mixed hearing loss. And the problem that novices have is that they don't have an organizational system in their brain to hold information. And so the first task I do is to give them an organizational structure that may or may not work for them the way that I organize it, but it gives them some starting point to think about how to organize the information because that way... If you have the proper shelves to hold information, you then can actually slot new information onto those same shelves. And once you have that sort of, we call it a schema in education. Once you have that schema of understanding, then you're able to cross-link information. You're able to think about things in a different way. And you don't have to focus on how the heck am I going to remember that Wardenberg's is an autosomal mm -hmm. dominant, you know, conge syndromic congenital cause of hearing loss. Well, we, we already went through the different organizational structure of how to think about that. And so the second, ob the second uh, thing I'll give you an example of is how I teach sleep studies. I'm a big believer in not giving lectures. I'm a big believer in leading discussions. Yeah. And to be a co-facilitator of learning as opposed to a content deliverer is an extremely difficult transition. And many educators have not done it because it's so much harder. And the example I give, and I may have done this for our residents down at, uh, down at UT Southwestern, but I started out the, the sleep study course with um, all the residents, right? So first years to fifth years, I had to pair off into, into, you know, uh, into pairs, and then I gave them each, a, each pair a different sleep study. Zero instruction has happened. We are basically level setting. And what I did was I gave them all the sleep studies and then each pair had to present their sleep study and tell me as much as they could about the sleep study. And so, you know, we got some really good insights. They sort of figured out like really fumbling with it, trying to figure out, and really it's looking at the raw data. It's not looking at the, the charts. I didn't want them to have the answers. I wanted them to figure out how to get the answers. And so all they have is the relative raw data. It's the analyzed data. So it's not completely raw, but it doesn't have any numbers on it. So then they have to figure out, okay, what are all the sensors I'm looking at? What are the inputs? How do I figure out what's going on? Once they struggle with that, then we did like a 20 to 30 minute didactic session talking about, okay, these are the different things you're looking at and giving back to examples and having people participate in the conversation. Like, oh, that makes so sense. I was looking at that number and I couldn't figure out what it was. I was like, okay, well, what do you think it is? Again, the Socratic method. What do you think it is? Well, I think it's this. Okay, tell me more. Why do you think that is? Well, maybe because of this. Okay, go on. What else? And so, and then have other people jump in the conversation. And then at the end of the class, they all got brand new sleep studies to do in their pairs. And they, again, read it. And then they look back at the numbers and universally, everybody got almost everything right on the second set. And they were able to read the sleep study for themselves, as opposed to looking at the AHI or just the report that came with it. And so this empowering, this, this, this type of education where you're using the Socratic method, you're doing a before and after, this takes a lot of planning and not a lot of people want to put that kind of time in for every educational session. Wow. That's awesome. How do you, I mean, now that we are unable to, you know, really meet in groups and have discussion type learning activities like that, how does that translate into you know, virtual into the virtual world. Is it, can you still have that, you know, facilitated discussion when you're only able to get together on Zoom or, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you not have everybody put themselves on mute? <laughs> I do not. Actually, I, I've given, I've given probably about 10 virtual, virtual sessions maybe in the last several months, maybe even more than 10. And the first thing I tell everybody is come off mute. 
This is a discussion. This is not a lecture. You will get more out of it if you participate than if you sit back and just listen. And so what I do is I create environments in which people have to interact or they have to answer questions. One way that I actually do in person as well as online and virtually is an audience response system. So I use software and I think Gopi's used this in the past because yes. I think that's helped set yep, it up for you. You sure did. Um, so uh, yeah, it, Poll Everywhere is actually the, the software I use, but there's a lot of different ones. There's Kahoot. There's a bunch of different ones that I, I actually just found out about, but I use Poll Everywhere and I use the open open word answers, not multiple choice. I think multiple choice just gets, leads to multiple guests and it doesn't really stir conversation as much as people have to generate their own, their own words and conceptualize uh, what they're learning and, and actually put it together on, on paper. Or, or in this in this sense on their keyboard. And so I use a lot of that early on to get the discussion going. And I say, you know, somebody put X. Again, totally anonymous. I have no idea who put that. I'm not cold calling the person that put that. I said, somebody put X. Can somebody tell me more about that? I did this with Strider. Uh, I put Strider was up there and I said, you know, somebody put Laringo Malaysia. Tell me, why do you think Strider happens in Laringo Malaysia? What is happening? And then, you know, somebody eventually after an uncomfortable five seconds, somebody, somebody uh, st uh, sits and says something. It's actually on average, you know, the longest you'll have to wait is about 12 seconds. I promise you. Um, they get just as uncomfortable as you do. And if you just wait it out, somebody will answer. I promise you. Um, I love that. <laughs> uh, yeah. My, my just, old, just my, wait it out. <laughs> just wait it out. Honestly, they get just as uncomfortable as you do. And, mm -hmm. and there's people who have the answers who just don't want to say anything. And when they get to the point of being so uncomfortable that they need to talk, they will. And then all of a sudden everybody starts talking. So you just have to embrace the uncomfortableness for those several seconds. And so I front load the audience response system because I want people to start getting talking. You'll find that even in virtual environments or even in person, when you start start doing the conversation early on, you don't need those ad, uh, adjuncts later on because people are now used to talking. And so they're more willing to participate, more willing, and you can actually draw on people like, hey, you know, Ashley said this before. What do you think about this now? And so Ashley may say, you know, now I think that X, Y, or Z. And so it starts this conversation. You give people, you know, not fact-based questions. You give them more, you know, conversational type questions so that they have to talk. Which is why, again, I don't like A, B, and C or multiple choice. The virtual environment is definitely more difficult. You can't really necessarily see people's faces. There's a lot of technology uh, problems. There's a lot of lag, people's audio. People are trying to eat. People are you know, watching their kids or their dogs. So there's a lot of other complications that happen. But it doesn't mean that you should go back to just sitting and pontificating for an hour. Because again, uh, passive learning leads to retention of only about 15 to 20%, even if you're using audiovisual. However, you, if you're active in the participation or you're actually teaching other people, you can reach 75 to 90% retention of the information. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, so, so, you know, active learning is where it's at. And so if you, if you default back to doing, Hey, just watch this recorded lecture, or I'm just going to do my lecture that I give every year and not let people talk or participate. You're doing everybody a disservice, including yourself, because you're not there to just talk for an hour and hear yourself talk. Your goal is to get them educated on the subject. Right. So why not do it the most efficient and science-based fat, you know, based on science, how they learn, as opposed to just sitting there and talking at them. Does this yeah. work for parenting as well? Because I'm about to start chunking my kids on how to <laughs> log in and out of their virtual sessions right now. Today was the first day of virtual school and woo, there's lots, lots of passwords that may or may not have worked. And Oh my you know, God, I can't even imagine. To, we may have had to skip a couple of uh, classes today, but uh, no, the, the teachers are amazing. They're, they're doing their job. But anyway, so sidebar. <laughs> that, that, that is a hard, you know, all, a lot of my friends have kids now going to virtual school, including my nephew. And I can't imagine what these teachers are doing because they're not their lesson plans were designed to be in person yeah and so the idea of doing virtual is a totally different ball game you have to think about things differently and especially when you have kids trying to get them to sit at a computer for eight hours or five hours whatever yeah. it is it's just it's a tremendous ask of these students as well as the teachers and i applaud all those people who are who are you know, working hard and diligently to try to make it work. No, for sure. Big uh, major shout out and applause to our teachers and our superintendents and 
and all the parents trying to get this get this going as well. But anyway, here, here. <laughs> I I feel like I feel like we can't conclude without asking you about your experience at Level X, and you know, can, can you you know at least just tell our listeners you know what that is and and kind of how that came to be. Speaking yeah, absolutely. of, um, you know, uh, like the non-traditional Online learning, learning styles. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Level X is essentially the brainchild of Sam Glassenberg, our CEO and founder, who found the company back in 2015. And his background was actually um, in software. He, his dad's a physician. He comes from a family of physicians. And he decided he didn't want to be a physician. So he went into software engineering, computer engineering. Um, his early on, he actually went and worked at Microsoft. And one of his tasks was actually actually creating DirectX. So his team actually correct, created software DirectX, which basically is the foundation of all the console uh, gaming platforms that was built mm. off of. And his team was in charge of that. He then uh, worked for LucasArts and uh, made video games through them, the Star Wars games. And then he actually became the CEO of a company that was making mobile games for Hollywood. And so they were actually making mobile games for Hunger Games and Creed and a bunch of other really big name titles that became really big. And so he really you know, cut his teeth in creating mobile games and making them really interesting and engaging. All the while his dad was uh, trying to teach, he's, he's a, a faculty at Northwestern University Medical Center, and he was trying to teach his trainees as an anesthesiologist how to do flexible, flexible fiber optic intubation. And so he said, Sam, you know, can you, can you lend me your hand and try to create something for my fellows and residents? And he said, absolutely. So Sam spent about three weekends creating a software-based solution for teaching them how to do flexible fiber optic intubation. And he put it up in the app store and gave it to his dad and said, here, you know, just have them download it. And Sam went back to his other business later to find out that it was uh, hugely popular and downloaded by, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Wow. And there was, you know, really interested in education using that platform. And there are actually some studies done on it. And so Sam saw this as an opportunity to lend his expertise to the healthcare industry and think a different way about how people experience information, how they engage in lifelong learning and how to make it more accessible. And so he started Level X back in 2015, 24, end of 2014, beginning of 2015. I initially came on as an advisor. I was fresh off my master's program and was uh, being an advisor on their Airway X platform. And really the, the goal of it is, is to create some kind of software-based solution um, that is app-based for practicing clinicians to experience information. And it may be rare and challenging cases, you know, akin to what they might read about in a journal or see it at a conference, but instead of reading about it and passively and not interacting with it, we made it interactive. So you actually are doing the case yourself. You're actually getting the same feedback you would in real life all on a touch screen. And the, the mission, the mission at Level X is uh, to advance the practice of uh, medicine through play. And so we made it completely free for end users. So all physicians, anybody in the healthcare industry or non-healthcare can actually download it completely for free, either Android or on, on iOS. And again, it's trying to make this concept that information should be freely accessible and able to be experienced by everybody. And so that's sort of the principle of what we do. We've gone into different specialties, anesthesia, cardiology, pulmonology, gastroenterology. We, you know, we have tons of new ones that we're going into on a regular basis. And so trying to just advance our suite about what we're presenting, we actually offer free CME. And, you know, you know, core to our mission is it's accessible. So you can get it uh, at 10 p.m. on your phone as opposed to traditional simulation where it's locked behind, uh, you know, some, some door and only the proctor can actually give you access to that room and you have to actually go somewhere to access it. Instead, this is on your phone. It's accessible at all times, uses the touch screen to be able to represent some of the stuff that you're going to be interacting with. And we go everywhere from, you know, hyper-realistic procedural based things like pulmonary bronchoscopy or colonoscopy to more medical decision-making and analytical skills, uh, such as the uh, diagnosis and treatment of diseases. We actually even came out with some COVID-19 content that was released back in April, May. And so, you know, we're just trying to, you know, really keep up to our promise of trying to make it free and accessible to all clinicians and anybody else who's interested. That's awesome, Eric. Congratulations. Um, that's Thank a major, you so much. Yeah, that's major. I know you've been on, you've had a lot of press, which is super exciting. USA Today, Fox 5, New York, Washington Post. It's a big deal for all our listeners out there. This is something super inventive, innovative, is on the forefront. 
I, yeah. I've played it. It's a lot of fun. I, I would recommend checking it out. <laughs> we we, we <laughs> it's, like we it's like to, to say there. that. Exactly. We, we like to say that it, it's fun with the unintended co- consequence of learning something. <laughs> I'm going to tell that to my kids when they do their Kumai. <laughs> All right. So they can find it on www.levelx.com or from the app store. Is that correct, Eric? Google Play as well. Google Play as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I've learned a ton. I've been inspired. And it was also nice to just reconnect with my friend and my partner, my colleague. I wish you the best of luck. And I just, I love hearing about all the exciting things going on. I'm super excited for you, Eric. Thanks guys. This was awesome. I really appreciate it. Hey, Eric, if if people want to find you on the socials, where do they go? Are you on Twitter? I am. Or... <laughs> yeah. So you can find me at, at Dr. Eric Gant, D-R-E-R-I-C-G-A-N-T. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Those are majority of my professional platforms. You can Google my name if you want to see some of the interviews I've done, including USA Today and Fox News. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Or, uh, and uh, you know, if you want to contact the podcast uh, folks, they can probably give you my email as well. Awesome. Thanks so much. It was great. Thank you to all our listeners for tuning in to Back Table at ENT. 